the objectives of Itophagy is to go through the background information on COPD, some surrogates of uh, mortality in COPD, current management strategies, and looking at how effective we are at the current time, and some uh, barriers to uh, effective care and some proposed models. So the definition of COPD, as we all have probably read about before, is a disease state characterized by persistent blockage of airflow from the lungs. The airflow limitation is usually progressive. Now, when we give this talk, a lot of times uh, some of our students will say, well, as you talked about more of the disease state and how things progress, it seems like it might be an underwhelming definition of what's going on. And I'll let you judge for yourself of what I'm uh, discussing. So we know that the risk factors are many, but the main risk factor being cigarette smoke uh, affecting COPD. But how does that really work? When we're looking at the lungs, and, and the end unit is, is considered an alveoli, this is what generally it looks like. And what we do have is defense cells that are normally present within the lungs. And when stimulated, they increase in numbers. But they also release a protease, an enzyme that breaks down lung tissue, unless they're counteracted by antiproteases. So what I'd like to I've highlighted here is this alpha-1 antitrypsin. That's going to be a, something I'm going to be talking about later on. But the depiction here shows that these are the defense cells, and with the ongoing inflammation, in addition to um, environmental factors, you get these units that should be looking like this. This. So what is the dominant effect of smoking? We know that with airway inflammation, what it does is it recruits higher levels of those defense cells that we talked about in the lungs, and they in turn increase the number and release of those proteases. What it also does, tobacco, is it enhances the release of the protease enzyme and its activity. But also, lastly, is it inhibits the alpha-1 uh, alpha antitrypsin function itself. All this leads to what we typically see in pictures of COPD. This is a representation of someone who's got severe emphysema. And this is a corresponding chest x-ray that uh, physicians will be looking at. So you'll probably be seeing this picture quite a bit. Um, and when we look at COPD, the upward trajectory from 1965 to 1998, there's been concerted efforts to either make this a plateau or even reverse this um, depiction. But when we d divide gender, and when we're looking at men versus women with COPD, what is the mortality associated with them? What we see in the yellow are men, and over the years from 1980 to 2000, there has been an increasing uh, trend, but a lot faster trend. So how are we looking at um, some surrogates that we can stay ahead of or monitor to prevent further mortality issues? This is a representation of uh, a 1977 article from Fletcher and Plateau. And they did a nice analysis of looking at what the lung function would look like if you were never a smoker. And you can see that the rate should be about a 35 milliliter per year decline. It's part of the natural processes. But if you're smoking, you'll be at a faster decline. This person here stopped at age 45. And you can kind of see that the trend decreases. Another person would smoke until the age of 65, and this would happen. And this would be this person who would be continuing to smoke. But there's a problem with this. It's not like a smooth. Uh, line that we see. This is generally more of what we, uh, we, we tend to experience. So the trajectory of patients with COPD, which part is more important? Is it the symptom part? Is it what we consider exacerbations? Is it this line or these lines that really matter? Or more importantly, what is the time? What is the time course when we're looking at all these things? So what I'll go through is what we mean by symptoms and maybe use surrogates of FEV1, which is one of the markers for spirometry lung functions, how, far, how quickly you can get some of these airflow out within the first second, uh, how far you're able to walk within six minutes, and then we'll talk about what this body index stands for. So when we do the classification scheme, and we base it on spirometry, one of those tests that you uh, blow into a device, what it does is it tells us FEV1 and some of the other parameters involved. With COPD, what we look at is, is staging patients with a mild, moderate, severe, or very severe. And if you look at the numbers, it goes from greater than 80%, 50 to 80, 30 to 50, and less than 30. Obviously, as the severity worsens, the lung functions are, are decreasing. And so initial looks uh, was, was the surrogate of uh, mortality FEV1 alone. There was some establishment that's saying that someone who's gotten old stage three or four, these patients here, had worse survival compared to those who were in mild forms. But that's not all. How far you're able to walk really makes a big difference as well in terms of mortality. 
on this axis here, we're looking at mortality. So someone who's walking less than 100 meters, we have about an 80% to 90% mortality. Someone who's walking more than 400, the meaning it's, it's less than that significant. So the question arises, are there strategies to improve distance, uh, thereby decrease mortality? And that's where pulmonary rehab kind of gets into play. But we talked about symptoms. What are symptoms? A lot of times when patients come through, we'll say, are you short of breath? But are we qualifying what those symptoms are? And this is a rating scheme for shortness of breath and detecting exacerbations, for just assessing how the day-to-day -day function is. A grade one is that you're not troubled by breathlessness, except on strenuous exercise. Or he goes to the more severe and says that you're too breathless to leave the house or breathless when dressing or undressing, and everything in between you're reading. So when we look at that, and we, there's a comparison back in 2002, looking at, again, those stages that we talked about, one, two, and three, based on the lung function, there's a dramatic difference when we're looking at symptomology. So someone who's got mild forms of shortness of breath compared to the person who's breathless. So back in 2004, what ended up happening is we looked at all these markers, and if we put it in a combination, does that make a big difference? So we have the FEV1, how far we walked, that distance scale, and Lastly, is also knowing the weight has a contributing factor to overall mortality. And so there's a scoring from 1, 2, 3, and uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3 with each category, and you would place into a quartile. 1 would be a score of 0 to 2, quartile 2 would be a score of 3 to 4, quartile 3 would be a score of 5 to 6, and quartile 4 would be 7 to 10. And again, what they did was they did a comparison just on FEV1 alone compared to the combination of all, all four measurements, and we see that there is a big difference. So we know that there is a lot of things that we need to be asking and monitoring in clinic to determine the risk of mortality for individual patients. We talked about this aspect, but what are these exacerbations? What do they mean? And do they happen periodically or do they happen frequently? And what's the time course on that? So if someone has, uh, again, the staging increases that we looked at, we look at the risk factor exacerbations, goal two, Hospital exacerbations happen within the first year of hospitalization is about uh, 10%, but they're pretty frequent at 22%. But these values also tend to increase as worsened lung functions occur. And what's the median time to recovery? The average time, if you were involved with, uh, or if you had uh, an exacerbation, you see that it takes you about one to 14 days for recovery, but the symptoms last for, uh, for four to 12, four to 14. And again, exacerbation, how do we define it? And it becomes a little challenging because it really matters on how you're asking the right questions again, right? But it's defined as an acute change in the patient's baseline dyspnea, or shortness of breath, terminology, cough and or sputum beyond the day-to-day -day variability. And this depiction from 2012 says that if you have an exacerbation, the likelihood of you going to getting a second one and subsequent ones becoming what's considered a clustering. They become more frequent and more severe in nature. So if that happens, are there, is everybody the same? Will, will they have a number of exacerbations being increased all the time? And the answer is no. There are patients who have no exacerbations. There are patients who have one to two exacerbations in our management of, within the hospital on an annual basis. And there's those who have more than three exacerbations with COPD. And you can see how there's a difference in mortality from that. So what are some current strategies that we're using to minimize these exacerbations? Well, the management goal, uh, while incurable for COPD, the management can improve quality of life, improve exercise, or what we consider functional capacity, reduce exacerbation rates, and prevent the progression of disease, and prevent and treat complications and reduce mortality, but it will not improve lung functions. So if you're looking at all these um, inhalation therapies, a lot more concentration is put on exacerbation rates, minimization, rather than the lung function itself. And treatment plans have always has also been an evolution. A number of years ago, this is a depiction of how the therapy should be based on. It was based on just FEV1, and as you look through, it's the staging that gets worse. All throughout, you want to have the reduction in risk factors. Right? Smoking cessation, you give influenza <coughs> vaccines, pneumonia vaccines, and you give as needed albiro, kind of like that 911 rescue medication. But once you get into the moderate category, there's a, a lot more maintenance therapies that are recommended. <coughs> And we talk about pulmonary rehabilitation. Again, this point I'd like for you to remember because of future slides, I'm going to talk about that. 
So it has evolved from this FDD1 to a combination of a number of things. What is the risk? This is the airflow limitation that FDD1. In combination with what the symptoms are, that grading scheme that we talked about, 0 to uh, 5, and the number of exacerbations. And depending on which category you, you, you go into, your therapies will differ. So if you are falling into category A, you are someone who has less symptoms and low risk for uh, exacerbations. If you have someone who has really severe uh, lung functions, you can be in this category or this category, and that will depend on your symptomology. So this is alphabet soup of how do you treat, and um, this is not necessarily for, for everyone to memorize it, but there are different strategies, and if you're looking at it, we are kind of going into the evolution of treating based on the person, what are the risk factors. And more importantly, we're noticing that all patients should be treated distinctly because there are phenotypic variants, meaning that the symptoms behave differently. So someone who's got COPD emphysema will be different from chronic bronchitis versus someone who's got an overlap with asthma. There are those individuals who have more exacerbations than not, independent of what we see classified with emphysema or chronic bronchitis. And then you have individuals with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency that go through that. But this depiction is basically this go through all that of uh, someone who's got chronic bronchitis, someone who's got an uh, emphysema picture, someone who's got an overlap, but also to say that there is a difference between men and women with COPD. So what, if we just talk about the lung functions and symptomologies, what we do do is that we miss the bigger picture. That it's not just a lung issue, that this condition is a multi-system involvement. That someone who's got uh, COPD will have high blood pressure, will have high cholesterol, will have coronary artery disease, and a number of other things. And as we look at it percentage-wise, if you look at just from heart conditions, risk factors, heart attacks, men 27%, women 14%. Congestive heart failure, 3% versus 7%. And as we come down, looking at anxiety and depression, which will be a major factor with a lot of adherence issues, 27% of men, 44% of women will have it. And the key thing here is that this is known to be a uh, very just successful smoking cessation. Right? So we've talked about even the mild conditions you want to do preventive medicine, you're not going to be able to achieve the success if you're not addressing some of these underlying issues. So this is a picture of someone who's got emphysema on the chest x ray, right? and this is a diseased lung. This is considered cirrhosis, scarring of the liver. Is this related to the combination of alcohol and uh, tobacco use or something else? And so then it becomes a matter of physician experience or healthcare provider experience of starting to recognize certain things. This is a patient who has alpha-1 antitrypsin. Approximately 3% of COPD patients don't have alpha-1. And this is an under-recognized and under-diagnosed process. The prevalence, well there's 3.4 million individuals with mutant alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, combination worldwide. There's different alleles, meaning that the combinations of PIZZ, this is one of the higher risk groups, there's 173,000 plus individuals. PISZ, which is intermediate, over 1 million. And based on the direct population screening studies, the prevalence of the higher risk groups, about 70,000. But only 5,000 have been currently diagnosed. So 95% are undiagnosed. So what do these all mean? The PICZ, the PI nose. Normal population, PIMM. And if you look, this number here, this 10, this is the value of what the levels, that antitrypsin, or anti, uh, alpha-1 uh, levels that we talked about initially, the antiprotease. You need to have a protected threshold above a certain number. 11 is the, the magic number. So someone who has got PISC in the intermediate, there are increased risk for damage in their lungs, possibly their liver. The PIZZ folks, they're well below that 11th threshold, and so that makes them very high risk for getting liver damage and uh, lung damage. PI knows is that you have very uh, high risk because you don't have the serum levels being present within the blood, but then you don't have an accumulation of those enzymes within the liver, making the risk of liver injury less. This is another depiction of how you can even see uh, someone who's got the alpha-1 antitrypsin compared to those who did not. When you check these levels, maybe high or normal based on the acute phase of reactants, it can increase by fourfold. But the reality is, are we checking enough 
for an individual with COPD. Right? We talk about smoking cessation, but we're not necessarily doing this as much. Comparing the normal population to someone who's got an intermediate population, and what this was was, uh, was an evaluation of CT scans. And as you can see, even low, considered low smoking history, the patients with that intermediate category had more emphysema than these two categories compared to those who did not. And remember that 30, 25 to 30 number we talked about normal loss and lung functions? Well, if you look at the PICC category, this was a study of 33 patients. If you're a smoker, the age of onset of shortness of breath happened at 32 years of age compared to non-smokers at 51 years of age. That average FEV1 value, 38% compared to 77%. And look at the rate of decline, 316 and 80 compared to that 25. If you smoke, looking at the smoking habits as the increase, gives you the same numbers of really low FEV1 compared to high smoking. But what happens based on gender and when you stop smoking? This is a man who smokes, 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 stops smoking, and you start getting a plateau. Smoked and then plateaued. Some of this may be that you're not going to get improvements anyways, what's considered a ground effect with the lung functions. So we've kind of changed in that evolution of treating that alphabetical soup to infrequent exacerbation based on the severity of lung functions, that you'll see that not every therapy is warranted the same for each individual. We want to consider the augmentation therapy for qualified patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin, actively address the comorbidity issues, smoking <coughs> cessation, immunizations, and pulmonary rehab. How well do we do that? When we're looking at uh, the study from 2013, this was 180 patients looking at the dyspnea, the shortness of breath, the rating system. They looked at the cough, sputum production, wheezing. They also looked at the lung functions. They looked at the staging system. And so you would think, well, there should be a lot of involvement in terms of that alphabetical suit that we talked about. But look, the short asking res rescue medications, you see, we're pretty good with that. We're pretty good with the combination of a long acting beta agonist plus inhaled corticosteroids at 90%. But some of the other ones, we're approaching 30% at most. When we go to pulmonary rehab, well, we said that it improves the functional capacity as well as exacerbation rates. This was a study over a three month period that it looked at patients who have already been uh, having an exacerbation. There was 30 patients who got usual care, meaning no pulmonary rehab, compared to 30 patients who didn't have a pulmonary rehab. So what happened to the second exacerbation? Significantly reduced um, from hospital and AD attendance as well as just the hospital admission. So we know that it's, it's beneficial to go through pulmonary rehab as a stable, meaning outpatient, but even after an exacerbation has been markedly improved in, in symptoms as well. Once they're enrolled, there's a low dropout from 9.7% to maybe 13%. But 34 to 49% of uh, participants attending after referral to the pulmonary rehab. So when they get there, they're, they're really light, loving it. But why can't they get there? Why the discrepancy? Well, there's some barriers to the referral pulmonary rehab. Perceived costs, perceived to only for the end stage category, reserved for those with impaired functional status, physical challenges, and then it becomes a patient motivation or transportation issues or even time allocated to it. What we've identified as some barriers to effective COPD management, and what I'll concentrate on what the low hanging fruit is access, patient knowledge, and uh, patient adherence, and physician knowledge. So the principles of a value-based uh, care is that patients will have access to healthcare providers and quality of care, and that will improve by cutting the costs. That's the premise. And by doing this, we've implemented known best practices, better diagnosis means that the right condition is treated, improving outcomes, and avoiding ineffective treatments. When we're looking at the definition of what access is, you can look at it as saying a way of getting near it or to something or someone freedom or ability to obtain or make use of something, and an increase by addition, such as sudden uh, access of wealth. When we're looking at it from a healthcare standpoint, we can say, well, it's a way of getting near an ad, uh, an office clinic or a healthcare provider or tools for proper assessment, freedom of, or ability to obtain, make the use of educational opportunities, and increase in addition of the access of health and time spent with the providers. Healthcare uh, responsibilities, um, you want to ensure an accurate diagnosis, so we talked about the phenotypic aspects, the testing for alpha-1, appropriate monitoring, spirometry, dyspnea scoring systems, 
But prescribing the appropriate treatment is also going to be really important. And that's going to be based on assessing the effectiveness or adherence and access to the medications. So 30 day supply versus 9 day supply, that makes a big difference for some individuals. Financial restrictions and social stigma that may prevent them to be optimized on their therapies. So there's a survey of 3,000 patients plus. 68% um, of COPD patients were seen in the primary care setting, 32% was the pulmonary specialist. In a family medicine clinic, uh, this is a study out of Duke University, uh, this is in 2005, 58% or 4.6 hours per day of all visits are for acute problems in their follow-up of care. And they say that an acute care takes precedence over both prevention and chronic disease management. I apologize, this didn't work very well, but what we're going to be looking at is the percentage of patients reporting that they got greater than one class of medications prescribed. Not, not as great as we would like it to be. And when we're looking at patients reporting at least one lab test in each blood gases, EKGs, the best thing was a chest x ray at 68%. Most was 30 to 40%. So the barriers to COPD are great. There's a lack of office logistics, meaning that not every clinic has a small entry. The knowledge of guideline recommendations may not necessarily be implemented all the time. The proper recognition of COPD and the core morbidities, we see that there's a lot of individuals who may go to different clinics, especially even the alpha one, it takes them six to seven providers before they get the proper diagnosis. Time constraints, the recommended minimum time to provide high quality medical management for COPD has been considered to be 10 minutes per visit. This is from the uh, Duke study as well. 10 minutes per visit. So, and what they've mentioned was it is possible that our choice of 10 minutes per recommended visit could overestimate the time required. So can we get all the things that we talked about done in 10 minutes for these patients? And this is one visit per year, not multiple visits. And then we ask about, well, what are the influences of COPD adherence? Have we addressed the psychological profiles? Have we given just medications and not the poly polypharmacy side effects or uh, limiting the adherence? Is it the access to medications and the follow-up that really determine why they're not getting better. So there was a trial protocol um, out in the UK, the primary care uh, specialties, that there are specific clinics with access to spirometry, pulse oximetry, nebulizers, and oxygen. It included a trained specialized nurse, a smoking cessation program, and patient education. And what they looked at was, it was a multi-center analysis, 22 months follow-up, of 458 patients. Patients with exacerbations, um, at an ER or at the hospital. And when we're looking at it, they ended up getting all these treatments that they needed to get. But there was a distinct thing of planned extra follow-up. Either you had no extra visit follow-up, you did get an extra visit or a call from the doctor, or you got an extra visit with the nurse. What they didn't mention was how closely after an exacerbation they, uh, this was done. There was a difference. Patients who had uh, a second exacerbation, which was 238 patients, the time to second exacerbation and cumulative survival was less uh, with the patients who had an extra plan visit with the nurse compared to those who had a visit compared to those who did not have anything. So in closing, a proactive and integrated approach with each discipline utilizing the strengths can improve the quality of life for individual COPD. As we look, there was a lot of factors involved in the management of care. There's a lot of time and dedication needed to optimize the goal. So as you look, you can see the physicians, the primary care, is going to be communicating with specialists, nurse coordinators, physical, respiratory, and occupational therapists, pharmacists, medical social worker, registered dietitian, psychologist, psychiatrist. Thank you.